And we're live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this stream. Uh, today, we have a very interesting philosophy conference for you with Weaver, uh, Ben, and Kabir. Um, we will first start off by having uh, Weaver introduce himself before we're diving into the philosophy conference. But before we do that, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, leave comments, chat, 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 support us. It helps us. So uh, perhaps Weaver, uh, you could perhaps introduce yourself uh, first uh, before we dive into the conference. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, first, uh, I would like to, take, to thank uh, Ben and Kabir who invited me to participate. My name is Weaver and I am a kind of a hybrid between a philosopher and an engineer. Uh, uh, I am very much into the ideas concerning the singularity and more specifically about uh, general intelligence and how to create something like that. And I'm interested in all sorts of multidisciplinary interesting things. And this is why I am calling myself Weaver because I try to weave everything into one more, uh, more or less, more or less, or less or more coherent uh, all, which is not always uh, successful. But this is what's interesting about about life, and I'm looking forward for this conversation. And. This avatar of mine will expire in about uh, one hour and 15 minutes and I will disappear. So let's make something out of it. <laughs> awesome, cool, thank you. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Where do you guys meet each other? Uh, yeah, I, I encountered Weaver and Kabir well before I got involved with a uh, blockchain and singularity in a, in a, in a hands-on manner. And actually the, the story goes back into the dim uh, archaic uh, period of the dawn of the internet, right? So I mean, in the, in the, in the late nineties, you know, I'd already been thinking about artificial general intelligence and related ideas for, quite a long time since I was even a little kid in, in the early 70s. But in the late 90s, when the internet became a thing and you had the, the, the World Wide Web and it, it became clear that the internet was gonna be a massive growth phenomena, I started thinking about the notion of a global brain, right? Like not, not only that you could build an AGI on your own computer or local network of computers, which I was already ex experimenting with in various ways, but that the network of computers all around the world could coordinate and cooperate together to yield a sort of emergent intelligence, sort of fueled by what humans put into it, acting in coordination with humans, but then increasingly having its own like coordinated self-organizing intelligence also. So I thought of this as the global brain and then I realized, as usually happens, other people had come up with a similar idea before. A guy named Peter Russell had written stuff, written something called the uh, the Global Brain, Global Brain Awakens, and uh, there there had been a there had been a whole bunch of uh, predecessors there, and a guy named Francis Heiligen who was a professor at, at Free University of Brussels, had around the same time started publishing his own thinking on, on what was what he was thinking of in terms of the global brain. So Francis and I organized a conference in, in 2001 in Brussels, which we called the Global Brain Zero Conference. And we, we, we almost had the, the Global Brain One Conference uh, in 2021, but COVID, COVID intervened and we, we, may, we, may, we may do it next year, who knows? But we realized we had slightly different perspectives on the global brain. Francis was thinking more that it would be purely something that emerged without 
sort of concerted action. Whereas I was thinking more, it would be something you would build, like you you would try to try intentionally to crystallize the the global brain out of out of uh, software that that you were you were creating. But anyway, we we had overlapping and interesting perspectives on this, and a bit of time passed, and Francis actually set up the Global Brain Institute at the Free University of, of, of Brussels. And in the context of the Global Brain Institute, I encountered Weaver and, and Kabir, who were both both grad students there. And I found, you know, we we each had our own different views on what what the hell we're doing with the with the global brain. But uh, but the, the views intersected and and coordinated in an in, in interesting way. And, I, you know, I, I remember one occasion, I guess we were in Brussels. It was myself, Weaver Kabira, my son, uh, Zarathustra, who's now doing his PhD in, in uh, machine learning for theory improving. But we were, we were discussing how you would coordinate all the different AI agents on the internet in, into a global brain and what kind of language you would use to, to, to have them collaborate and cooperate among them. And pretty much what we were discussing then with the four of us was what's now become the AI DSL. I mean, we were discussing, well, yeah, if you really want to have a cooperative emergent system of AIs getting some emergent intelligence, you need a language for all the agents to talk to each other. And the, we've now formalized that as, as AI DSL, but another, Another thing we chatted about there was, of course, that you need hardware infrastructure to power all these AIs. So somehow this self-organizing system has, has, has got to include, include a computing hardware aspect, aspect as well. And this is not all of NuNet, but it's a significant aspect of what, what NuNet is, sort of how to, how to channel design structure the, the incorporation of processing and computing resources into the emergent, emerging global brain. So I think, uh, you know, there's a, a pipeline from philosophical conception and like wild ass ideas and theorizing to formalization with mathematics, to implementation and deployment in computer systems, to then building communities around, around these computer systems. And we've, we've been engaged with, with various stages of, the, of this, pipeline together for for quite some time and it's a uh, super cool to see so many of these abstract ideas we've been fleshing out together for a long time like work their way into practical reality of like stuff running on our on our phones and laptops and so forth i think i think what uh, the at the thing, this global brand institute the, we were doing pretty much the with Weaver, we decided that we are doing research which we call freedom and constraint. And and I mean, so we were we were doing our doctoral thesis uh, and the research. And the, the idea of the freedom and constraint is how so how much freedom we have to give to those agents in order to self-organize. I mean, if if we talk about the about the NUNET and singularity net and all the communication between agents and what the language should give them. So how much freedom we have to sort of provide for agents to decide for themselves, how do they co collaborate and how much uh, sort of constraints or guidance we have to put into the system in order for something interesting or supposedly intelligence, intelligent in our current understanding come out of the system. And it's uh, pretty much, I mean, very, let's say conceptual question, we, we, we cannot exactly know. And what, what Ben mentioned about the, the hardware and software parts, uh, when we look at the interaction between NUNET and, and what uh, NUNET and, uh, and, and uh, Singularity Net, it's not exactly clear where is the border between those, because there is a language which talks and where is the border between hardware and where is the border between uh, software? It's not clear as, as well as in the mind. It's not clear where is, the, where is the mind, where is the brain? And actually, can we have mind without the brain? And can we have brain without a mind? And basically, is it the same or is it different? 
Yeah, I think that also this uh, boundary between hardware and software is something which is changing as long as our uh, understanding of the world, of the physical world, of the mind, of the brain is changing. Also, this boundary is changing. And at a certain point, we see this is an hardware and that is software and they are interacting in a certain manner. But in just a couple of years, it can be completely different. And actually, even today, it's already, it's already getting away from say hardware which is realizing uh, something like a von Neumann architecture towards neural networks or uh, neuromorphic uh, chips. So even the notion of hardware is all the time changing and all along also software. And maybe to say something about freedom, freedom and constraints that you just started to describe in our uh, in our research program. And I want to connect it to this uh, project about uh, the project about uh, NuNet as, as a distributed, as its distributed platform. And I heard many times this question, what is it that uh, distributed, uh, distributed approaches or methods, uh, what advantage such methods are giving us? Uh, and we know that mostly it seems that they only spell problems and difficulties. So, and this goes this goes really into this uh, philosophical realm because when you uh, when you define an agent in terms of relationship between uh, degrees of freedoms and constraints. Uh, agents, different agents can know uh, about each other anything which is to do with the constraints that define them. And what remains to be found is the, is the unknowns that are embedded in the degrees of freedoms. How a certain agent will respond to a certain signal or a certain set of signals or to a certain environment in a manner that I cannot know. And the interaction, the interaction between agents that don't know everything about each other and cannot have a full model of each other is to my mind something very fundamental in how intelligence and sense making is, is emerging in the first place. And this is like one of the branches of the idea of open-ended intelligence. It's not all of it, but it is connected. So for, for the people at home, can you please define what open-ended intelligence exactly is? Ah, okay. <laughs> if that were possible, it wouldn't be open-ended. It'd, it'd, be, it'd be, come on. So that's, uh, that's <laughs> yeah, like, that's, uh, that's like people... asking, can you, can you please explain the inexplicable? <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, so Ben, you, you, you're, you're, just, uh, you're just saying what I, I was, actually, I was trying to, when I was thinking about this uh, conversation, I was, I was telling myself, okay, I have to prepare for one question and one question only. It's the question that you may just uh, uh, ask right now. And I was about to say that the most difficult thing to grasp about open-ended intelligence is that it is really open-ended. So once you have a model, mm -hmm. once you have a model uh, of what you think is open-ended intelligence, you are already in a different complementary realm. It's not the open-endedness anymore, which is, which is uh, contained within a model. And this, is, this is, seems like a simple, but very, very not trivial uh, idea. And 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 uh, um, in order to make it more accessible, I would like only to remark one thing: is that if we think, if we try to think about thinking, uh, I can say, and everybody can just try to examine it in, uh, for himself or herself, is that. Thinking is something which is unbound. 
And it stops to be unbound when it produces a certain product. And what we want to, what we, in, in order to understand what is open-ended intelligence is try to transcend this uh, fact of life, let's say, that whenever we have a product of our thinking, be it a model, be it an idea, be it an experience, be it a, an action or, or, or an algorithm, this is something that stops thinking. And what we want is to step out of this in order to let thinking to continue indefinitely. So this is like maybe like a very, very brief introduction to what it's all about. I know that it is lacking, but maybe in the course of the conversation. Yeah, I, I have a, I've gravitated toward a complementary but slightly different way of, of phrasing it, which does oversimplify in, in some regards, but also <clears throat> perhaps helps to clarify some aspects of what open intelligence is to, to some people. So the, the, way, the way I've been expressing it when talking about open-ended intelligence recently in this sort of AGI context is, first of all, you're viewing an intelligence system as a complex, self-organizing, adaptive, dynamical system. So it's a system with a bunch of different parts and they're communicating and cooperating, coordinating, ad adapting, adapting to each other. The parts of the system have their own autonomy in a way, but the system also hangs together as a whole system, at least in, in some sense and from some, from some perspective. So we're, we're definitely taking a sort of complex systems theory view of intelligence rather than say looking at an intelligence as primarily a problem solving algorithm right so i mean an intelligence may solve problems it has to of course but the fundamental essence is it's a complex self-organizing system which is you know building up itself taking apart itself interacting with its with its with other, with other systems and with other things in, in its environment you can then look at a bunch of properties of systems like this and one thing you can look at is what Weaver calls in his PhD thesis titled Open-Ended Intelligence, which I'd encourage everyone to take a look at. I mean, one, one, one property you can associate with a complex self-organizing system is individuation, which is a deep philosophical concept. But I, I mean, in, the, in the, the crux of it is this system maintaining uh, as a coherent system over, over, over time, rather than like dispersing into a bunch of, uh, of molecules that are randomly distributed everywhere, the system maintains itself, right? And I mean, this is survival in an evolutionary context of the individual organism or, or of the species or of the, the DNA pattern, but that, so there's individuation. <clears throat> and then there's what I think of as self-transcendence, self which there's a bunch of other words for, which is tied with development. It's the system rebuilding itself into something fundamentally going beyond what it what it what it was before so i mean you've got you've got individuation and you've got self-transcendence which leads to what weaver called in this thesis like transductive chains where the system builds itself into a new system which builds itself into a new system and these are complementary things and they're also from some perspectives co contradictory things because of course maintaining your identity as an individual continuously that can that can uh, have interesting and complex interrelationship with fundamentally reinventing yourself as as something totally different over and over again and, i mean you, you we see this sort of paraconsistent dialectic in in our our lives because uh, we like in what sense am i the same guy i was at like age 2 or let alone at even age 45, but uh, age two or, or, or two months, right? There, there has been individuation, not just the same body, but some of the same personality characteristics. But I've also reinvented and rebuilt myself in many ways. But how, how much more powerful will that become once you can replace your hardware with, with new hardware and sort of design 
design new physical implementations for part of yourself or you know mer merge with with other minds in a, in a, in a stronger sense than than humans habitually do so an open ended intelligence is a complex self organizing adaptive system that's you know ongoingly pursuing its own individuation and its own self transcendence and doing that in the real world which is full of all sorts of complex chaotic crazy stuff i mean that that in practice intrinsically evo involves you know adaptation to the complex environment and it it involves making up a lot of goals and working to pursue those goals but it also involves making up new goals at different times as you as you go along and this all this sort of thinking underlies singularity net in the first place right i mean this is why singularity net it's not like one AI algorithm to rule them all with one goal to rule them all. I mean, this is why I, I thought like you, you want a diverse assemblage of AIs all cooperating together to, to figure out what the hell they're doing and to define new goals and how to pursue those goals. And you're constantly pulling new things into the system other things will, will, will leave the system. So the singularity net network to succeed in growing toward emergent general intelligence it's got to individuate and it's got to repeatedly self transcend. Now, NuNet, in a way, just adds, adds another necessary component to this complex self organizing system. I mean, si Singularity Net, it's a protocol for AI software agents to communicate with each other, but those AI software agents all need compute resources, right? And they need data resources, they need human resources, they need many kinds of resources. Singularity net in itself sort of doesn't deal, it doesn't deal with that, with that aspect. I mean, it isolates it and leaves it a separate layer, which is, is how modern tech stacks work. I mean, it, it, it's fine. You, you, you want to modularize your software systems and software networks, but then new net deals with, in a way, the open-ended intelligence, the individuation and repeated self-transcendence of the, the network of resources which are making themselves available for singularity net or other decentralized networks that can run on top of, of new net. And then of course, to do that requires subtle software designs and tokenomic designs. I mean, just as to get, to get open-ended intelligence to work in biology involves subtle mo molecular biology and quantum physics designs and so forth. Yeah. I, uh... Uh, if to use a, to use a, maybe a biological a biological metaphor, it seems to me that NuNet is a kind of a metabolic metabolic uh, platform. It provides a metabolism for a higher uh, a higher uh, level of organization, which will allow, of course, also. A, evolutionary opportunities that are not there are not there uh, before and you can add to this also a medium in the form of a language or a protocol that allows allows uh, uh, different cells or different organisms to come into uh, what I would call a collaborative uh, sense making or participatory uh, sense making, which is to do with uh, which is to do with uh, with the emergence of intelligence, and just one 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 more point about uh, your description about the open ended intelligence is something which is taking place as a tension between uh, between individuation and self transcendence. Uh, philosophically speaking, I see these two as just uh, aspect within a continuum from individuation to self transcendence because every in every process of individuation also uh, already embeds self transcendence and vice versa self transcendence must embed a certain kind of individuation and and I think this is the this is the point of departure. While when we need to implement it within our 
within our current uh, understanding of, of the physical world, of computers, of computing, etc., of course we need to enclose to enclose these con concepts within a certain uh, within a certain uh, uh, operational model that might give the impression that self transcendence and individuation are different, but actually they are just are uh, existing on the same spectrum. And out of some engineering uh, requirements and demands, sometimes they are made separable in some sense. But, but this is how I, I, I would like to emphasize this point about this, the conceptual versus the, the more practical or concrete approach to uh, how to think about it. Yeah, go, going back to your, your reference to metabolism, I mean, I, I of course, was immediately drawn to the definition of life as consisting of metabolism plus reproduction. I mean, the life like intelligence doesn't need a single crisp formal definition. It's also an open ended concept, but the combination of metabolism and reproduction characterizes a uh, uh, the living systems we see on, on earth around us. And I think Nunet's machinery does allow metabolism among the various computing resources supporting decentralized networks like SingularityNet and so on. I, I would say also that the tokenomic logic of Nunet is key for reproduction, right? And I mean, you you want you want the network of of processors underlying the new net system to grow over time, and not not just to survive as an individual, but to get to get bigger and bigger until the vast majority of compute resources on the planet are being provisioned within within the new net network. So that that requires reproduction, much like life has colonized the earth right like I, I mean in the in the early days of the earth it was mostly inorganic molecules around then organic molecules came, became more dominant little proto life forms became more dominant and then we got we got what we now refer to as uh, Gaia right which it, which it, which is the uh, interlocking bacteria and other microscopic life forms that that occupy a lot of the atmosphere in the ocean and the inside our, our bodies and, 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 so, and so forth. So just like life's ability to reproduce as well as metabolize, let it spread through the earth. I think Nunet's ability to reproduce and expand itself as well as yeah. to metabolize and maintain itself is what should enable it to grow and you know become potentially in some number of years that the dominant mode of, of organization of uh, of com com computing and data resources on on the on the planet, right? And the token tokenomics, of course, has in it the potential for exponential growth, as you see in the cryptocurrency world on on the on the economic level now. And of course, we're we're still pushing toward the phase of rapid exponential growth in terms of the number of AIs on. On singularity net platform, but you can you can clearly see the potential there in the in the the nature of the tokenomic mechanisms. Yeah. This is uh, something quite interesting in the new net design, really, the way the protocols for interaction of compute resources interoperate with the new net token and then other other tokens that are used by processes running on top of NuNet, such as the AG, AGIX token or the a ADA token and, and so forth. And these these help fuel the the reproduction and ex exponential growth. And again, if if you come back to individuation and self-transcendence, I mean, of, of course, these are all quite complex things, but we, we can see that metabolism in biological life is a key ingredient of individuation, like without metabolism, the cell doesn't produce the energy, it doesn't channel the energy to keep itself together, it disperses. And of course, reproduction is one key path toward iterated self transcendence of, of, of biological entities. So I think that the life metaphor sort of, and not just metaphor, I mean that the, the 
casting of this in terms of life processes fits in clearly with the the framing we've given to open-ended intelligence and then it yeah these things they cash out in one way in human cognition and development where humans have their own form of individuation and self-transcendence over their lives they cash out another way in biology generally speaking where you have metabolism and reproduction of microorganisms and then in in new net system they cash out in the in a different but rela related way right where you have software protocols and then you have you have tokenomics which contribute to both the individuation and self transcendent yeah. I think I, I would like to sort of uh, work on uh, sort of put on top of this metaphor of metabolics. I think that it's a nice. So let's say in terms of metabolics, when we have uh, when we have interaction between cells, they basically they have ion channels and there are different ions coming in and they are changing all kind of chemical processes and they are going out and so on and so forth. So we can say that uh, let's say that these uh, ions are tokens, and we have metabolics somehow in in a way we express this metabolics i mean th this is this is an interesting part is how what what we were been said about the about the open -ended intelligence is just basically it's even not you cannot even explain it and or, or constrain it at what we are, we are trying to do we are trying to engineer it which is by default it's trying to define it so there is a, also a very I think it requires certain uh, non-conventional approach to the software architecture and how do we build software? Because we do not exactly know what it will do at the end because it has to self-organize and it has to evolve. And however, we don't want it, we want it to do something intelligent. But back to the, to the metabolics, I think it's a very good, uh, yes, metaphor for NUNET is that metabolics in NUNET is interaction between the different, let's call it tokens, which bring different value. And when they interact together, they create something new. Right, so I think this, this yeah, is I, addition to the- I think that, uh, that following, following uh, your idea and also what Ben started to say, I. I'm just expanding this uh, metaphor that uh, just came and think that uh, in some uh, very profound sense, uh, what we want to do in terms, if we, if we use life as a metaphor, is what is called uh, a niche, con niche construction, is that we want to create a certain population of agents, of processes that are constructing a certain niche which is being inherited by their, uh, their newer and uh, newer versions in a manner that actually encourages this uh, exponential expansion. And, uh, and the niche construction is, 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 a, is a manner of, uh, of uh, inheritance Inheritance, is it the right word in English? It's, it's a manner of inheritance, which is not genetically, uh, it's not found on uh, genetic materials, but on the way that you reorganize your environment for interactions with the environment. And I think that to think about NUNET and what comes uh, with the uh, AI, uh, AI DSL, I think the combination of these two is actually very well understood in terms of niche construction that will encourage more and more uh, resources to be absorbed into this uh, system and to grow much like uh, this uh, uh, world of bacteria took over the whole atmosphere and actually made it more uh, adapted to uh, to complex life forms to emerge, so this is this is a very nice uh, analogy between the two as as a kind of a, at least a, a visionary trajectory of what we want to see coming up in the coming years. Would you agree with me? 
Yes. Uh, I, I just wanted to also, we are talking about this. I, I think Ben said, okay, so the global brain, and so the, there will be, Lunet will take over, I mean, it's a takeover. There will be a system which will connect. However, when we are thinking, it's a decentralized system, which means it's just a language enabling different configurations of processes to match from that. And those processes may not be the, most probably they will not be one process. They will not be coordinated in, in one manner. It's a language for them to, as, as we say now, biosphere. Yes, right. We have this understanding that there is a biosphere and it's some sort of single entity. It's not a single entity. It's a lot of interacting entities. And this is what, what Moonet will become. Or it's, this is the idea behind. So therefore, while we are talking about the system which we are building, it's rather, well, we call it decentralized system, but decentralized system meaning, it means a system of systems interacting between themselves on the different layers. And I, see, I, I wanted to point this out when, we, when we're talking about the growing system how it will grow. It yeah, will grow right. by making richer itself and making more children. You, you are right by saying that uh, not only decentralized, but also, but also open-ended in the sense of uh, being able to accommodate a growing number of strategies that we don't even know right now what they will be. But a real platform like uh, the platform of life allows this exactly this the employment or end deployment of a variety a multiplicity of different strategies in order to uh, uh, both to sustain to sustain your own existence and also to uh, to expand so Ibi, Ibi, I'm, uh, I'm interested to return things to you and your more uh, practical orientation for a moment. So you, you've, you've come into Nuna from sort of a blockchain and software perspective, right? Where we're building, we're building Singularity Net, which is, is, is aimed at creating decentralized AGI and then NuNet sort of spinning off from Singularity Net to provide a, a parallel in some ways similar, in some ways different network for you know, decentralized tokenomic you know, coordination of, of, of comp compute power. And I think from a practical NuNet perspective, I mean, we're looking at marshalling computing power and then we're, we're looking at what early applications can we do with this? So we've been talking about I mean, we've been experimenting with a new net based fake, fake news monitoring and identification and, and characterization of what is fake news among, among a community. And then thinking about using new net to power, to power uh, decentralized social networks more, 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 more broadly, like the networks that will obsolete Facebook and, uh, and, and Twitter and, and all these like, uh, Quasi malevolent corporate social networks that are dominating too much of human society now. So I'm, I'm curious, Ibi, from from your view, like how, how do you, how do you correlate these philosophical depths with the practical view of uh, of Nuna, and how are there any questions or directions you, you'd like to see our our philosophical. Uh, rambling go in so as to sort of manifest that connection with it with the practical yeah yeah well um i guess we're kind of like creating uh systems of systems and api of api and, and it, it's basically uh, everywhere in our ecosystem right uh, so with NuNet, uh with singularity dao sophia dao Raju, we're all building a leg there right um and that's kind of parallel in, in, in how these legs are also being built perhaps for cognitive synergy. So I would be interested to learn perhaps more about the relationship between cognitive synergy and um, the open-ended intelligence and how that would... What, what, what's interesting in what you mentioned before we get to that even is like the, tradi the traditional tech stack, I mean, you have layers upon, you have TCP IP protocol and you, you have operating systems, you have layers upon layers. But each of these layers is static 
and not a complex adaptive system. And many, but not all of those layers are centralized in ownership and control. Some are not. I mean, the internet itself is beautifully decentralized, although there are forces trying to squash that, right? So in a way, what we're trying to do is replace the traditional tech stack, which is static components that are updated only by, you know, people up, update, updating the software now and then. There's static components, which are mostly centralized in ownership and control. We're trying to replace that tech stack with a, a decentralized network of decentralized networks where the different layers in the tech stack may be represented by different decentralized networks, which in some cases have different participants and different tokenomics, but then, but, and then what can happen is the interaction at the boundary between different networks and the decentralized network of decentralized networks, the interaction in that boundary can itself evolve, right? I mean, just yeah. as humans interaction with, with its environment uh, evolves, but yeah, perhaps Kabir could have something to say about how NuNet interacts with singularity net in, in, in that way. But re regarding cognitive synergy that you mentioned, I think the, the key notion of cognitive synergy is really that two cognitive systems that can share their intermediate states with each other, like share what's going on inside them as well as their, their end results. When one of them gets stuck, the other one can can help it out, right? And that cognitive synergy between NuNet and SingularityNet, we're quite a ways from seeing that pop out of the networks now, but is quite interesting and deep thing, right? That's like if if an emergent AI running on SingularityNet gets confused, maybe it needs more resources, and then NuNet does some adaptation to figure out how to get it, how to get it. The resources it needs, and if 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 NuNet gets confused about what resources to provision to who, then SingularityNet is AIs running in SingularityNet are consulted to solve that cognitive problem, right? And so then you you can have you can have some interesting cognitive synergies between those components once we've gotten a lot of adoption and things are, are like significantly further along than they, than they are now. Uh, if, if to, to somehow make it uh, boringly concrete about the singularity net and, and moon net interaction is, so, I mean, yes, we use this kind of almost a metaphor by saying, so singularity net is software and moon net is hardware and, uh, right? So software needs hardware, so th this is the interaction. However, it's it's a simplification which allows us to do things, and this is this is a fun part of of the of the NuNet project is that we have to make simplifications in order to make things move and to work and to progress to the second level. However, we also have to have into in in mind or take into account the overall concept of what we are doing, and if we go to the open end of intelligence, which is almost indescribable. There is always uh, back and forth between the two of, and this is basically, this, this, this is sort of uh, encoded in the name of uh, freedom and constraint. There is no uh, exact balance or a middle between them. There's always back and forth. And this is how the individuation of the intelligence systems come about. So again, back to the, <laughs> to the, to the maybe a little bit more concrete. So I think the very simple answer is AI DSL. We want to use the same language, both for the singularity net and for NuNet. And the way, the things that we enable by using the same language is, is the computational reflection, meaning that algorithms or software, let's say algorithms. Uh, we should be able to reason about uh, hardware on which they run. What kind of hardware they need, what kind of uh, resources they need in order to, 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 to run themselves, let's say. And of course, there is, there is comes, immediately comes the economic, the metabolic or this economic uh, aspect that 
the 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 physical uh, physical units which is computing computing resources they need electricity they need uh, well money let's say for to pay for electricity they need the connection to the tokenomic system and to the whole economy and economy and the iron iron channels and the ions themselves and the, how do you get them um, it's I, I want to add something about it, about uh, AI, uh, AI DSL, is that I must confess that I don't have a lot of uh, knowledge about the concrete aspects of it, its current state of design, etc. But I know something about language. And, and from the standpoint of open-ended intelligence, what is most important, if not critical, is that this language will be uh, built in such a manner that it will not constrain the agents that are using it in the manner they care about their environment. Or in other words, uh, it will allow such agents to have a completely different perspective about their environment and what's going on. And this this will achieve two two different uh, two different uh, uh, goals that I think that are important. One of them, it will allow uh, agents to be the evolutionary context of each other within a, a self-organizing, complex, adaptive uh, population of interacting agents. This is one thing. And the second thing is that it will, in some sense, I believe, uh, allowing every agent to have its own perspective and its own way of caring about the environment, it will create a certain dynamic, self-organized, balanced balance that will prevent from all sorts of uh, dystopian or apocalyptic uh, ways of, of visions of uh, AI or AGI taking over the world, destroying the world or things like this. I think that this dynamic balance, which exists also in the sphere of life, very apparently, always there are species that are being born and species that are being uh, destroyed but there is a certain fine balance that keeps everything together in a, in a kind of a beneficial uh, equilibrium or dynamic equilibrium. And I think this is important and, and, and I believe that this has a lot to do with how this uh, AI DSL will, will, um, will be designed. Uh, and yes, and so, so the, the engineering, I had to say this now in the, well, let's call in advanced beginning stage of development. I don't know, maybe Ben will say something, describe it something somewhat differently, but this is pretty much the problem that we are tackling is, okay, there is a language. We want this language to be uh, fluid so that the language evolves itself and adapts to what is needed by the agents to talk about. However, we also want this language to sort of to prime it in order that it has to mean something. Because we, we when we talk about software and hardware, we also at the one spectrum of, there is a self-organization spectrum and then there is a mathematical proof, but what things can do. And we want basically to cover the whole spectrum of the language. And if we want to, to prove something that happens in the computational system, we want to have grounded terms of and agreement among, among all the agents that this is what it is. And agreement means, I mean, it's not an objective truth, but it's uh, exactly that. It's an agreement of, the, of what is true and what is not at certain, I mean, at certain point. And what, what, what terms mean. And the interaction between the two is, uh, Well, how to say it's not. I mean, it's not only a challenge, but it's. I think it's one of the main uh, things that we are solving in the AI DSL design. 
that's a period. Yeah, that's the end of the sentence. <laughs> All right. So um, here's another question. So we've talked about um, you know the mind or software and uh, the brain in relation to it. Um, how are we going to go about this? Um, how is NuNet going to contribute to this at SingularityNet um, to achieve you know this? This goal. Sorry. Singularity. Yeah. To achieve singularity. <laughs> Uh, well, so I, uh, well, I, I think I, at least from from my, uh, I'm not, I mean, so the, the language, building a language to talk between uh, agents without, uh, bet well, between software and hardware in the sense, if we use this metaphor that, I mean, not metaphor, but kind of uh, image that there is, there is a clear difference between software and hardware, but we use the same language. So that is, uh, sim I mean, the, the straightforward way to say it. Of course, uh, we use the same language and let's say the same metabolic system, which is blockchain world and micropayments and smart contracts. So by that, we sort of enable the strange interaction between mind and brain, which we sort of trying to, to figure out whether it's different or not. Uh, Yes, in the world of, of engineering software slash hardware system. And talking about the difficult, I mean, uh, relation between hardware and software, imagine, for example, when quantum computers become uh, something that we can all use. Quantum computers, they do computation on the quantum level, on the basically it's hardware. You, you cannot distinguish the two. However, you can build a task for quantum computer to compute and to give to others, maybe conventional computers to process further or do whatever they do. So by using the same language, we enable that. However, if we sort of uh, make a very clear distinction between hardware software, and we don't even need to go to the quantum computers. There are GPU for, GPUs of the same uh, as the cards which just uh, crunch uh, you know, Bitcoin network and they cannot do anything else. But so there are certain certain processes which we which were, we have to take into account on what kind of hardware they run on, and there are certain processes which are actually a piece of hardware, which you simply interact with using the same language, and therefore this is the interaction between singularity net and net. <laughs> May I ask what is the singularity? You you asked TB, TB you asked. Uh, how do we get there? But what is it that that uh, we want to get at actually? I know that it's like almost a given, and it's a topic of many conversations. But maybe there is a place to say something about it. Well, the moment that machines could think for themselves, right? or to achieve perhaps some level of consciousness. That's what I would perhaps look at as a first. Yeah, I mean, the, the singularity of like open-ended intelligence uh, can't be pinned down precisely. I mean, what we're looking at something that is is uh, singular and it's, it's as such, it's quite different than, than where we are now and we, we can't, fully understand what it's going to be from from where we are now. I, I think Ray, Ray Kurzweil has given a very pragmatic view of the singularity, which is we're, we're going to get AIs that are dramatically smarter than than humans. And this is this is going to lead us to be able to manipulate biological systems the, the way we do now with uh, Lego blocks and, and engineered engineered systems using using a nanotechnology, ultimately femtotechnology and, and so forth. So I mean, we, we can pragmatically look at the singularity as, you know, superhuman AGIs with a very flexible control to manipulate mind and matter according to their, their goals. And that, that gets us a fairly long way in terms of looking at the singularity in, in every everyday terms. I think more in a more profound sense, one could think about the singularity as, as a sort of major 
developmental transition in the maturity of the the global brain on on the on the planet right so if you like if you if you build an agi in your basement or perhaps more likely i build an agi in in, in my basement and we 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 code it and uh, i i code this agi in, in my house without telling anyone in evenings and weekends and it it achieves superhuman intelligence and then it mind uploads me into it and then it ports us into some other dimension and we say you know so long and thanks for all the fish i mean that's a in a way that's a kind of singularity but it's mostly not what people are 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 thinking of right what we're thinking of is more the the global brain of humanity is advancing toward greater and greater intelligence in many different subsystems in robots and nanotech and biotech and longevity and in supply chains and automatic production of artworks and then human psychology and human social relations are ad- adapting to that overall and of course adaptation and growth in these things is happening all the time with the singularity we're looking at technical technological advance happening so fast on on multiple coupled aspects that you're seeing a sort of phase transition in the operation of the of the of the global brain sort of like i mean puberty is a phase transition in in human development right i mean you have ongoing development throughout childhood then during puberty you're like you're changing in market in dramatic ways and you come out quite differently afterwards so we're we're looking at a similar or even greater phase transition much like further back on earth we had a phase transition from single cell to multicellular life forms right it's not like there weren't wasn't growth before that but there was there was there was a big jump and after that all sorts of different things were growing and i think we're looking at a comparable or greater big big jump in evolution of the of the global brain and what the way i look at what we're doing with systems like singularity net new net open cog hyperon and all the rest i mean we're looking at catalyzing the emergence of a beneficial singularity and that's that goes back to the sort of difference of focus between francis hollingen and myself and the global brain one conference in in 2001 where Francis was just like the global brain is already here the global brain is developing and advancing further and further and our task is mostly just to measure its intelligence and understand what the hell it's doing and to caricature a bit my my view was well you know we're going to this is going to be built by people just like the internet was built, was built by people and i mean we we've got to engineer the critical subsystems underlying the underlying the the emerging global brain i think my view has drifted a little more toward francis's since 2001 but not not all that far like i still think we've got to build the systems that will direct the evolution of of the global brain toward more coherent intelligence and also toward toward more beneficial outcomes but i mean it's it's who's going to build all the ai processes running on singularity net or all the compute processes r- running on the three of us nor any of our employees nor even mostly people that that we know right so we're 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 trying to make systems in which the activities that the human race is going to do anyway are better coordinated for open ended intelligence and 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 positive benefit Yeah, hey, one one thing that I want to add Ben uh, is uh, the, 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 there is a tendency as you mentioned uh, Ray Kurzweil but not only him is that from a perspective a purely engineering and pragmatic uh, perspective is to see an event an event or possible event of singularity as something which is it can be measured or described in uh, quantitative terms while i would very much want everybody who deals with this idea to take into account that there is also a qualitative uh, dimension to to the singularity or to the idea of singularity 
And it is true that in many, uh, many thinkers that are remarking on this or uh, writing, uh, writing or talking about it, there is an attempt to, to say that there is a, a transition or there is a way to translate qu qual a quantitative a singularity into something which is qualitative. And I'm not sure that this, this is like straightforward or given at all times. So uh, when we speak about phase transition, uh, and I really like this concept, but phase transitions are not necessarily uh, the emergence of new qualities out of quantities. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it's not, and it requires something extra. And this something extra is somehow connected to this open-ended intelligence and the self-transcendence, is that you have a model or you have a, or a, con a, a concept which is, uh, allows you to measure, uh, to create uh, engineering systems, to solve problems. And when this explodes, it is not necessary or it is not a given that this will uh, uh, come to be a qualitative change. So we need, we need, uh, we need to address this dimension as well uh, in our thinking about uh, singularity. When you say beneficial singularity, okay, it already hints towards that. But again, what is it beneficial in terms it is transcending our current mode of understanding, current concepts or current image of what is a beneficial intelligence. We have a vague understanding of what it might be, but it usually has to do with our, with our agendas or our wishes. Well, yeah, I mean, be benefit in the end also comes back to individuation and self-transcendence, right? I mean, an individual yeah. or, or a culture feels something is beneficial if it helps it persist and, and, and helps it to grow. And then having systems on different scales and with, with overlap among each other, I mean, of course, you have quite complex uh, interrelationships between, between what, what militates toward the benefit, the individuation or self-transcendence of this system yeah versus that system. And in the end, you know, tokenomics, as we're currently perceiving it, is a crude tool for, for, for mediating the benefit of, of these multiple overlapping organizations. I mean, it, it's better than the traditional money economy with the USD and RMB and all that. So I mean, scripting utility tokens governed by smart contracts, it certainly gives more flexibility to work toward the benefit of complex networks of entities on different levels than the traditional money economy. Yes, it but avoids not, the necessary evil. Yeah, but it's not the end game, right? And this, this, no. this, this also brings up the notion of offer networks that Kabir and I and uh, my son Zarathustra and his master's thesis had, 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 had worked on, which is using AIs to mediate like multi-party barter exchanges among, among individuals as a complementary mode of, of transaction to dealing with, uh, you know, one dimensional tokens that, that quantify value. And what, so for, for example, in, in an offer network, I, I, I could, I could say, well, I will, I will, uh, you know, figure out what AI algorithm is best for this data set, which someone else cares about. If if somebody will, you know, op 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 optimize this code for me that I care about. So I'll, I'll, I'll do a certain action for some party. If some possibly different party does another action for me, and this is a barter exchange, right? And you, you could then have. A will do something for someone, if B does something for someone else, if C does something for someone else, and you can have complex loops of parties doing things that benefit other parties. And you can have these complex multi-party barter networks without, without money payment, right? Now, what, what becomes clear when you dig into it is 
there's some contexts where a single dimensional token, like the, the new net token is exactly the right thing. And there's a lot of contexts where that's exactly the right thing. Like there are some things that are just easy to quantify and project into one dimension. And you, and you, you have a large, large efficiency in exchanging value with a token like that. There are other things which are more unique and nebulous and it's not that useful to project them to a single token. An example of that would be like, I'll help with your research project if you help with mine, or I'll review your book if you, you review mine. And the, these are sort of, uh, these are more sort of touchy, feely, unique, one-on-one one -on -one things, which are often better dealt with by other modes of exchange than, than one-dimensional tokenomic payment. And I think uh, this is another way that both NuNet and SingularityNet will grow over time. I mean, the token aspect will continue to be important and the, you know, the, the value of AGIX and NuNet token will grow and grow. But we're, 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 we're also going to see non-token based smart contract exchange mechanisms like offer networks grow up and, and flourish here. And that's going to be really important to the cognitive synergy of these different networks. And that's really a whole topic unto itself. But I mean, uh, Kabir has written some great stuff on offer networks, which, which one can, can find online and which will work its way into new net over the over the coming years yeah yeah for me for me this uh, idea of offer network is is a subset is maybe a primitive subset of uh, what i would call sense making and when you grow from a exchange of tokens to exchange of uh, smart contracts you just they go one level up in the level uh, in uh, sophistication and complexity, but this is only this is only a trajectory that points towards complexification of relationships between agents, and and also creation of niches of that that support certain. Uh, Certain populations of uh, or subpopulations of agents. So this is uh, this uh, seems to me uh, an interesting trajectory where the offer networks is only the first step towards towards a, a, a very dynamic and interesting intelligent uh, intelligent uh, ecology. Well, I, I think that often the project which we call offer networks, and I mean it was it was it was this what what Ben said, uh, sort of non-monetary exchange. However, if we look, I think it's somehow when we put it there, it's more or less in the middle. There, there, there is a lot there are a lot of stuff before that with this conceptual. What does that exactly mean? Which would uh, I would say it's. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, from the computational perspective, it's multi-dimensional search and matching, let's say. But from, from, from the individual or from open-ended intelligence perspective is how do agents which do not know anything about each other and have different, let's say, needs or even non-individuated understandings of what they need, what they don't need, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe certain metabolics, certain beginnings, they come together, start to interact, and figure out what exactly do they want from each other. It's not given from the beginning of interaction, but the language, which again, this, this is another aspect of AI DSL, of flexibility and fluidity of AI DSL, at least the way I'm, I'm looking at it. How do we allow that, that to happen rather than to say, OK, this is US dollar. The US dollar is very variable. The value is defined by da, 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 da. everybody knows what's the value. Let's go. Let's build on that. But we are going from another side. And of course, <laughs> now, so the, the tokenomics and the blockchain and the, the crypto world gives us a certain flexibility in a sense that we have more than one currency and which already can interact, but it's also a middle way. Uh, we can sort of uh, imagine that those currencies, they, they, or let's say tokens, they, and this is the way the, way the, the, the space evolves, they represent certain certain values, 
However, those values are already defined by somebody. But what we want from the beginning is that the, the, the actual value of exchange of what, what the, let's say what one AI algorithm does for another AI algorithm is not defined in objective, objective manner. It is defined by the interaction between those two algorithms and deciding what do they really get from each other. Yes, this is this is what I call sense making. Yes, it's an aspect or a description of uh, sense making. It's exactly this: is that the agreement or the way that agents agree about what's going to happen is not homogeneous and dictated by a certain language or a certain protocol, etc. But the protocol and the language are enabling factors for a higher. Uh, a, a higher exchange interaction of sense making and and this i think is is crucial to the emergence of intelligent systems like the spontaneous emergence of uh, intelligent systems it's really but it's really there the seeds are there already it's uh, we just have to work out the details <laughs> yeah, this uh, you know this this reminds me uh, weaver of it it reminds me of one of the key applications I've been thinking about in a new net context since the be since the beginning, which is uh, social social networks among among humans, right? Because I, I I I think that uh, I mean I was thinking about that initially from a very pragmatic standpoint. Like if you want to make a decentralized replacement for Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok, and then going on even to the to the next level. I mean, the hard part, of course, is building building traction for that in a community, but you also need a lot of compute resources for the AI that 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 drives these things in, in many aspects behind behind the scenes. And where does all that AI come from, right? If it comes from centralized server farms and who pays for that, then you're driven toward an advertising model, which which leads you down very familiar pathological routes right so if if you had a way for people in effect to donate or contribute the compute time that would power the ai that let their decentralized social networks be smart enough to be usable and interesting right i mean then then you're starting to see how a decentralized ecosystem could could be used to foster like the the next use huge social network breakthrough and it it had to be something subtler than like the AI underlying my social network account runs on my phone or laptop, right? Because our own hardware resources are going to come and go over time. So but if you have something like NuNet powering the provisioning of hardware resources underlying the AI underlying a decentralized social network, you can see how that can work and, and can avoid the need for people to look at a lot, of, a lot of ads or pay a huge subscription fee for the, for the social network because they're sort of paying, they're paying for the hardware resources by putting their hardware resources into, into NUNA and then all the tokenomics has to work on, on, on the back end. But what I see in the comments you're making now, of, of, of course, is there's, a, there's also subtler aspects here to using NUNA, which in its ultimate form is like a, a social network among processing resources, like you, you, using that as the infrastructure for a social network among people. Because you, you have what's in the abstract sense, like a tech stack of social networks, like, like a social network of processing resources, a social network of AI agents in SingularityNet, which are socializing and farming communities and, and collaborating via AI DSL. And then among other things that can support is a social network of, of humans who are in a way evolving their own languages for, for communicating. I mean, the, the evolution of, of memes on the internet, and of course the word meme meant something different when it, when it was proposed. And not, not, now it's come to mean sort of, uh, you know, funny little cartoons or, or animations. But I mean, the, the, the whole language of memes on the internet, it is, it is the evolution of a new multimodal language for, for human communication and we're we're seeing the evolution of a, a whole bunch of new languages and, and sub languages on the on the internet now 
even even with these centralized social networks that are really stultifying and conformist in, in their dynamics, right? So I think when once we have this decentralized network of decentralized networks ecosystem more, more more fully evolved with human social networks as sort of one of the layers in, in, in the network of networks, we get we get very interesting interoperation of the languages at, at, at the different levels, right? In new net, singularity net, singularity net. Now of course once 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 you bring brain computer interfacing into it, then everyone's brain becomes a new net node and thing, things go on to a, a whole more interesting level. But we, we, may, we may leave that to the next uh, philosophy discussion. I don't know. Yeah, yeah but, but, but your point about the democratization of, uh, of uh, the internet in terms of uh, the social networks and actually the... Um, the manner by which computing resources will be actually the means of production, as I think in the in the Marxist text, it's this redistributing the means of production and labor can have the potential to create uh, something completely new that is uh, more, I think, more aligned with the. Uh, initial vision of what the internet is and its role in the development of, uh, of humanity. Um, and this diverts quite, quite strongly from this capitalist um, direction it takes today where just a few agents are actually controlling all the means of, of communication between humans, between processes, the means of communication and computing, of course. So, yeah, I see. I I, I see a point here also. Well, I think I think that uh, uh, also continuing with what what uh, what we were said, and so I uh, let's say just making a fa taking a Facebook and making it decentralized or running on decentralized hardware is not enough. I mean. So this is something that we were, um, you said about the qualitative, qualitative aspect of singularity, qualitative and quantitative, sort of dif difference between qualitative and quantitative aspects of singularity. And I think it's, I mean, it's important, first of all, to think about it. Uh, but it's also important to see how can this qualitative change come about it, within the process of decentralization. I do not think that just decentralization gives it. I mean, technical decentralization. Let's put everything on single computers. Let's not give all the data to whatever Facebook server. But I mean, I, 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 I kind of um, caricaturize this. If, we, if the, all the social network is exchanging cat pictures or it, it just, just continues doing that, well, it won't have that quality of change. I mean, I, I respect very much the cat, cat the, 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 uh, the kind of uh, influence of cats on, the sing on singularity, but still I think we have to have, we have to, I mean, uh, I would like to see thinking about the quality of change within all this technical stuff that we're doing. Yeah, Kabir, I mean, I know this is supposed to be a, a stream focused on the philosophy and the depths underlying NuNet. But I, I, I wonder, as the guy in charge of making it all happen in reality, like how, how do you see the gradual year by year progress from the current relatively simple condition of NuNet toward, toward something that, that realizes all these cosmic ambitions? Uh, so, the few things I think I already mentioned is I think one, one of the important thing is that uh, the relation between the concept and the each step that we're doing and carefully, carefully sort of not carefully Observing that we do not disconnect ourselves from the 
from what we want to become and what we're doing for the immediate, let's say, needs and versions and current current realities, let's say. So the and the the the, the it's a as I said some, somewhere somewhere a few 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 minutes ago or a few tens of minutes ago that it's a uh, interesting engineering, let's say, philosophy that I'm trying to think about is that we are building system which should evolve its own goals and should be fluid. Therefore, we have, on the other hand, we are engineering it. Each each point of the of the system, it has to be engineered. It has to work with the current uh, current. Uh, means and current uh, environment, let's say. Uh, so, of course, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, uh, first of all, the, 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 this emergence of NUNAT, it's emergence of NUNAT is emergence by itself because it will kind of self-organize. It will not self-organize like randomly because we have an idea what we want to build. However, we are building, uh, first of all, means of communicating with the community and onboarding them in order to, to guide this self-organization, let's say, of the system. And it will, it will gradually individuate. Uh, that would be, I'm not sure what is a very pragmatic answer, actually, but, uh, so, in terms of more, more, let's say, pragmatically from the from the soft, software software design or software slash hardware design uh, design perspective, uh, so it relates to the to the to the to the previous topic is that how do we how do we express and how do we manifest uh, the concept of open and intelligent is something that is concrete. And there is no direct way to manifest it except having the concept and understanding undescribable. Yeah, and I, mean, I think in, and in the modern build... tech economy and even more so in the AI and blockchain spaces, I mean, building things with an open-ended mindset and design vibe is uh, incredibly important because like no, none of us knows where the crypto economy is going to be one month from now, let, let alone three years from now. And also none of us knows what big tech or the singular unit research team is going to brew up in, in AI by the, by the end of next year. I mean, let alone the increasing volatility and peculiarity of you know inter international relations and pandemics and, and, and so forth so i mean any brittle systems are going to have a harder and harder time surviving as technological singularity approaches I, th I think that that's that's increasingly clear and i mean with the with with that in mind i mean of of course we can't plot out in detail the path from where NuNet is now to to a scenario where the majority of the world's compute resources are provisioned via NuNet and where the majority of the world's population are using social networks that bottom out on singularity net and and NuNet. I mean, I think we can we can say something about what the path is likely to look like but it's uh it's it's gonna have to adapt adapt uh, a lot based on circumstances i mean i think if we if we look at hardware resources which as you say is not the only interesting sort of resource that that nunet can be involved with but it is, is certainly a, an important part and an initial focus i mean i, I think uh, the diversity of hardware resources that will want to pull in to the decentralized network we're building using network is one interesting thing to think about, right? I mean, we, we've all got these, uh, these 
phones that have hardware resources on them, but then, I mean, companies have ambient computing resources behind the scenes, but then there's server farms sitting all over, many of which don't currently have the sophistication of instrumentation that AWS or Azure has, but they have much cheaper processing cycles. And to the extent that we can, we can gradually build up the infrastructure to utilize more and more of the, the processing power in various server farms all over the place into global AI computing networks. I mean, we'll be gradually building out, building out the, the new net network. And I think there's, there's a lot of strategic thinking. I know, I know you've you've done there into how do we pull in these different sorts of. So computers. I think I think if if we if we uh, put everything to the to the roadmap, let's say first of all we have a certain horizon of of, of planning which we do not want to go over because we want to be flexible. Second is what we want to do. We want first of all to describe the language between for the all the devices to interact. So that it's uh, so that we can we can join other other hardware devices with, when it comes comes about. Let's say now we we sort of identify the coming huge hardware decentralized hardware infrastructure, which will be in in built into the autonomous cars, self-driving cars, which will be basically GPU farms, which on on wheels. And things that we don't even imagine now, and in order to make this system uh, alive, we have to build the language which describes any computational resource that will allow us to join those computational resources when they get developed. Whatever new things that we can imagine, the, the, as I said, uh, autonomous cars, uh, quantum computers, neuromorphic chips, uh, other things that 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 that, that have button and Dyson spheres or, or whatever. So <laughs> the 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 general principle is to stay uh, reasonably uh, use case and concrete machines agnostic for the new net so that. So that it can, it can allow other things to join. However, already start building that. That uh, this is what we are doing now with the private alpha, which is running. Is that we uh, by thinking about how it can be uh, machine agnostic, machine type agnostic, we already allow certain types of, of of hardware to join the network and to test it. And immediately when we do that, we look for others. What let's say what what nice things that happened, nice and sort of surprising is that community started to say okay uh, what about Raspberry Pi so, uh, how how do I join it and what about virtual machines, and then we start to look okay how do we actually allow people with those with those uh, compute devices to join the network, and we are growing it slowly. However, we are not just uh, focusing on that specific thing. We are building the whole the whole platform by using these, let's say, uh, demands of the of the community at this point. Uh, so, and this is how Nunet will is going to evolve. Yeah, I I, I want to add uh, just uh, another point to this pragmatic outlook is that. Uh, I believe that in order for NuNet and the whole uh, vision of the Singularity Net to succeed, but I will focus now on, on NuNet, is it at a certain, not very far stage, it will need to be integrated into the technological fabric around, meaning to find relevant large-scale uh, use cases and clients that will feedback on what is wonderful about it and what is wrong about it. So it will, the, the environment, the technological environment will provide us with the reference point in relation to each to evolve and not develop it just in a kind of, a, in a sort of autistic, autistic space of ideas that does not connect to 
to uh, real cases, real technologies, real enterprises, real ideas, etc. And I think it's quite, it's, it's quite uh, critical that things like this will happen, that we'll, we will have a lot of feedback about what we are doing and how to, how to make it on one end very far reaching and on the other end uh, uh, pragmatically making sense to current projects, enterprises, companies, problems. You mentioned the uh, autonomous cars, internet of things or whatever. I don't even uh, want to start to enumerate them, but I think you know what, what I'm talking about. So that's yes. another, another point I would... And this, this again, this balance between, uh, between the pragmatic, pragmatic usages which has to be uh, have to be now we, because we don't want to wait for some I don't know months and years until supposedly the platform works and then it can do something useful, but also making sort of keeping it open for the to evolve and to on to to sort of to be uh, open and concrete implementation use cases agnostic so to speak. It's a uh, it's an art. And one of the things from from the from the I mean it's an art and it's a, it's a big part of the job let's say, but and one of the things that I think uh, is a good very concrete aspect that we're, what we're doing or basically Dagim who is our tech lead is mostly taking taking care of with is the, to keep the technical depth as low as possible which is not exactly possible to keep it zero meaning that. We are building certain things that should work. However, we try not to build something that we already know that will be obsolete as soon as we will jump to another use case. So whatever we're doing, it has to have component what we, we, we want to achieve right now with, let's say with a private alpha version. However, it has to have a significant component of what we will do with that, with that piece of software in the future in the Nunat platform. And this is always a balance and playing around how to how to sort of go about it. I'm I think I'm a, I'm more into always more into sort of future rather than current implementations. But uh, but it's always a dialogue and trying to find a balance because of course we have to we have to build our versions. We have to go with our milestones. And to make things working from the well, maybe not day one, maybe day two at least. Yeah, if I if I may ask, so um, centralized companies, of course, are working on uh, AI, and some of them also on AGI research. Um, so what I'm wondering is what what is it that these companies are doing that would contribute to malevolent AGI, and why is it? that for benevolent similarity, we need to have a decentralized AGI point plan. Yeah, I, I mean, decentralization is not in itself necessarily good, but it gives you flexibility and it gives it gives you openness, right? So, I mean, I mean, what's what's clear in human history is that set centralization uh, i mean that that in human systems seems to lead to elites that become corrupt and and selfish and even if the people involved are good-hearted individuals in some sense just the the nature of being in, in that much power corrupts things in, in various ways and and things don't work out for broadest benefit and Centralization, decentralization opens things up more, right? I mean, of course, you can have a decentralized society like parts of Somalia, which are bands of armed mercenaries running around shooting people. And I would rather live in a more centralized place like the US than in that particular decentralized society. So decentralization is not a panacea, but it gives an environment in which you know, more adaptive, dynamic, complex, beneficial structures 
can be coaxed to, to self-organize. And I mean, this holds on the level of human systems, it holds on the level of compute resources, and it holds on the, on the, on the level of, of, of AI agents as well. So it's not enough just to build a decentralized network. You need to build a decentralized network. Then you need to nudge the self-organizing processes happening within that decentralized network in broadly beneficial directions. And going back to Weaver's point about what is benefit, I mean, individuation and self-transcendence of this system or that system or, 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 that, or that system. I mean, at, at a very crude first pass, we can look at, well, of, of all the different systems that we know about, which are human systems, social groups, you know, biological systems on, on the planet, AI systems, like at least we would like to see individuation and self-transcendence like benefit for a broad variety of these systems get fostered instead of just for a small number of, of, of these systems and some self-appointed elite. And you, of course, I mean, that's still a particular value that we're articulating. We're saying we want broader good instead of narrower good just for a few systems. So you could view that as a, it's a, a meta value, which is, is therefore just, just a value in, in, in the end. But I mean, decentralized networks do, they give you the avenue to foster that meta value of breadth of goodness and having goodness for, for a wider wider variety of of systems. I mean if we if we go back to the three high level values I articulated in my book A Cosmist Manifesto back in 2010, I was looking at joy, growth, and choice as high level values that, that have meaning across a great great variety of systems and I went there to some length to define what those mean in a broad sense, which, which, which I won't do now. But you, you could see that decentralized networks, they have more potential to foster a greater amount of joy, growth, and, and, and choice. And part of that's just for information processing reasons. I mean, I've highlighted human corruption in centralized networks as a, a key and very important point. but. It's also the fact that a centralized network, you know, it has a weakness of just the processing bandwidth and the energetic bandwidth of, of the centralized control nexus. And then everything is, everything is constrained by that. Decentralized architectures, you know, from a computer science view, they can seem harder to architect because our computer science has, orig has sort of evolved around the von Neumann architecture, which is centralized in, in some respects. But then when you open up to a biology view, I mean, that starts to seem the, the easier way to do things because bi biological networks, they've, they've evo evolved to be, to be decentralized. And I mean, the internet is that way, the open source software community is, is, is that way. So I think in, in, in that vein, NuNet can, can contribute to the provision of decentralized protocols and then by choosing which applications to foster on NuNet in the early years, such as a decentralized social network for, for broad benefit or biology research running across NuNet and so forth, by choosing what applications to put on NuNet in the early years, we're then trying to direct the potential of this decentralized network to so that will man manifest its 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 potential for good. Yeah, I, I would like to, Ben, I would like to compliment your answer to say a few more things. I wouldn't even try to enter, uh, to bring into this, the scope of our discussion now, the ethical, the ethical perspective, but it seems to me that centralized systems uh, and the way that uh, centralized systems are uh, developing uh, strategies of control, uh, they, tend to, they tend to fall into first 
דוגמה, in the sense of their uh, outlook, and even more so, they tend to homogenize, homogenize the way uh, they see things and the way that they make others or other subsystems to see things. And it seems to me that from the standpoint of open-ended intelligence, uh, um, um, uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, tendency towards dogma and towards uh, humanogenization are very strong factors in stopping thinking. So if we want a, a, a thinking which is unbound, which is like another way to say open-ended intelligence or evolving intelligence, it seems to me naturally to go from the idea of centralization uh, into the idea of something, uh, something which is decentralized. And as you say, not every decentralized system uh, will be endowed with the qualities that will support the evolution of intelligence. And also in some places, Loc localities of centralizations make more sense, but on the overall, on the more, uh, on the more conceptual uh, level, I would certainly vote for a heterogeneous decentralization, not only decentralization, but heterogeneity as a, as, as a critical aspect of of a favorable, favorable environment or ecology for the uh, uh, self-transcending intelligence. So it's not, it's not so much an ethical point, but I think it more, more philosophical or conceptual in this sense. Uh, I, I would, I would complement also uh, with the sense that I'm looking at this from the Let's say from the systemic perspective, also. Uh, well, it's difficult to say whether it's 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 value with, with value based or not. But from the systemic perspective, centralized systems are fragile, and decentralized systems are anti-fragile. Therefore, therefore, if you, we want, and then I mean, the question comes: Okay, why would we? So, anti-fragile systems are the systems which are which are which are thriving on change. They become stronger, or let's say they evolve when they uh, they uh, meet the uncertainty and they meet the change. While fragile systems, they actually get weaker when they meet change. So now, if we if we thinking about evolution and transcendence and open endedness, and this is already value based. If we want that, we have to build systems which become stronger by meeting these, 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 these things, which is uncertainty, open-endedness, and evolution. And these are not, this is what Weaver said, this centralized systems are not this kind of systems because they enclose certain values and they self-protect themselves. However, there are no such things as just, I mean, uh, there is no such thing as completely centralized system, well, we can imagine. But there are also no such thing as completely decentralized system. And I do not think that there is a, and it's, it's not related, well, usually we say centralization is bad, decentralization is good, but I do not think that this is completely correct. We, there is, so the way I'm thinking of decentralization is more in the sense that dynamism and ability for those systems to change. Because as, as, as we were said, there are, there are certain localities where centralization is important. And Ben also said, let's say, you don't want to live in Somalia where people are running around and shooting. So locally, centralized systems, they make sense and they're efficient. They're efficient to achieve certain things. However, when they start to lock everything around in those systems, they become a cancer which grows and which makes the whole society or whatever, whichever metaphor we take, biosphere, etc., cetera, and so on, fragile and in a, unable to change, unable to change from within, and also unable to cope with uh, shocks or 
environmental changes. And that is, that's not a life. And yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, there's an analog here with the, the role of reward maximization as a goal for AI systems. I mean, in, in the mainstream of the AI field today, people are viewing AIs as systems that, that are looking at maximizing a certain fixed reward function. And then they're, everything they're doing is trying to maximize that, that reward. And that, that in a way is a, that's like a fixed centralized motivational system really. Whereas in, in open-ended intelligence, I mean, neither individuation nor self-transcendence has to be pinned down to a precise definition. And as a system grows and evolves, it may come up with many different goal and reward functions and try to maximize them for a while. Then as it evolves more, it may adapt or throw out its old goal and come up with a new one, which I've done countless times over, over my, my own life. I think centralization is a bit like that too. I mean, there's many times when a centralized structure is the best way to, to get something done. And that, that can be the most efficient way to achieve some task, be it a centralized structure among a group of humans or a centralized structure among a bunch of compute algorithms or, or, or processors. The thing is the the overall self-organizing activity in the decentralized network has got to spin up the reward function or spin up the centralized structure, allow it to do its thing for as long as is, is useful and then let it adapt and, and lead to the evolution of, of something else after its interval of, of maximal applicability is, is done, right? So, I mean, within a new, to be very concrete, like within, within a new net network, certainly you could have collections of processors that are organized in a top-down centralized way with a central hub that's controlling other nodes and so forth. But, that, but that's not the foundational architecture of, of the network. That's something that ha has been aggregated for a certain purpose, for a certain, a certain period of time. And you know, within a, a decentralized social network built on, on top of singularity net and, and new net, I mean, you, you could have sub networks that operate for a period of time, very much like a centralized social network. But then if the people get sick of that and want to adapt it somehow because of the decentralized infrastructure, they have agency to choose to you know, migrate their data and morph that into, into some, some other form rather than being trapped in that centralized structure, which, which should not be the, the foundational architecture. I think, uh, yes, so in the, what, what ben, ben, you said just now is uh, right. So what we're doing in NUNET, we are not building, uh, so what we, we NUNET allows to, on demand to build uh, hardware and software interaction to, to, to do certain goal, which is at that moment, you can say it's centralized because it has a goal to, to compute something. It has a certain hierarchy of what runs on what and what kind of, uh, what, uh, what responses and calls go to what. But once this, this goal is finished, it dissolves into the, into the, into the ecosystem of computing, computing devices and algorithms, which allows other subsystems to evolve out of these components. So, right, and this is kind of balance or interplay between centralization, decentralization without locking the system up into, into very uh, right, rigid, rigid components. Yes, it also spells in some, in some indirect way the balance between individuation and self-transcendence. It's not a straightforward connection, but I think there is a certain correlation between the two. The two relationships, I mean. Yes. All right. Um, so I think that we're coming to the end of this stream. Um, I'll just uh, quick ask here, any final reflections from Kabir? Ben or Weaver. How about from yourself, Ibby? Any 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 final reflections on life, life, the universe, uh, Nunet, and everything else, and the 
the impending absorption of all compute power on the planet into the new net decentralized network? I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, let's go. Let's do it. Let's build it. <laughs> we're, 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 all, we're already building it. But we're, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to a, a phase transition in, in development progress as we sort of release the token and, and disperse the alpha and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I feel that, that we have the best team in the world to achieve these goals, right? And to work towards these goals. Uh, I think, I think uh, the, 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 what, what, uh, what Ben, ben meant, mentioned this word absorption. And I think there is another, it's not exactly absorps, absorption, but more invitation. We want, uh, Right, I mean, I call it community or developers or those devices which we know exist somewhere in the world, everywhere in the world. I and mean, everybody of us, at least in, in the places where we live in, in those uh, longitudes and, and uh, we, I have, I think, five devices just on my, on, my, on my desktop now. And then few other devices somewhere in the, in the, in the cupboard. So we want to absorb or invite them, let's say, into the network. And that is, that is I think, the, the, the power, and that is uh, the best team in the world. What we can do, we can incentivize and catalyze this interaction. So I would, I would like to see NuNet and SingularityNet and the whole SingularityNet ecosystem as this catalyzer. Yes. We I think it will, it will fit everybody that wants to play for the sake of playing and not just playing for the sake of winning. And that's like encompasses the whole, uh, the whole philosophy of participation, yes? If you want to participate in order to take over everything is one thing, but if you want to participate in order to evolve, it's quite another thing, and we are for the second, not for the first. It's um, and I think it's possible. We agree, Weaver. So with that, I think I'm going to be closing this stream. Um, so I want to thank everybody so much for watching. Thank you for liking. If you haven't done so yet, please do. Thank you for subscribing, same thing there. And definitely place a comment, share this stream with others that might find this interesting. And we'll see you the next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, thanks Ebby, for uh, zookeeping this uh, <laughs> menagerie of uh, renegade philosophers. And uh, th thanks to everyone who managed to, managed to Let's listen through all this and figure out what, what the hell we're talking about. But I, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the path from philosophy to math to software to communities using, using software is, uh, it involves a lot of indirections, but it's, it's really important to have all those, all those parts active. And what it's, it, when you just work on the implementation and, community you get something that people are using but it may it may not be the right thing actually according to any, anybody's conception of right and so i think it it'll be important as new net grows to keep the keep sort of all the levels of this process active with with, with feed forward and and feedback so we're not only rolling out amazing software that a lot of a lot of people use and it's generating a lot of value for everyone in, in, in the network but we we want to make sure that what we're building you know continues to realize all these all these underlying concepts and that's that's one reason i, I was so happy to uh see kabir sort of uh transition from a pure research role that he was playing when we first met into the role of, of running and coordinating NuNet in practice now. Not that he's dropped his research interests any, any more than, than I have, but I think, you know, we need to combine the practicality to roll these things out and build them and get them used with the mindset that 
that keeps some focus on the core mission and values and concepts on underlying underlying what what we're doing. And I mean that's an ongoing interesting challenge for me running Singularity Net. And I think uh, Kabir is going to be doing the same funky paraconsistent uh, balancing act as he as he runs Nunet and as it grows. It's fun. It is. <laughs> all right. Cool. Thank you all. And uh, bye bye.